Hello and welcome back to a, another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And we're here with uh, the weekly news session again. And of course, the only man that brings us the news is Nick Bendel. Hello, Nick. Hello, Owen. Thank you. Always great to be with you. My pleasure. It's um, We're the ones that are grateful to have you here. So um, bringing us the news. It's... Um, and um, Nick, tell us what, what's what's been happening in your week the last week. Anything exciting? Well, I, I'm a boring person who sometimes does exciting things. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm the owner of a business called Hunter and Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. We work with a lot of mortgage brokers. And over the past week, we have helped two mortgage brokers with award submissions. Fantastic. And did they win? Well, time will tell. The uh, the winners have not yet been announced. I, oh, I hope okay. they both win. The suspense is killing me. I hope they both win, which is possible, because they enter different categories. Okay, different categories. All right. Well, um, make sure to let us know so that we can congratulate you for your win. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I know we've discussed this before. Uh, all credit would go to them. Oh, that sucks. Oh, well, I hope you get paid well for it. Thank you for reminding me to invoice them, which I will certainly do. Uh, how <laughs> has your week been? Um, this past week has been um, a bit of a consolidation week. We've been um, uh, busy with um, having bought a, a another business recently. And so um, helping to consolidate that and get that um, all tucked in. So um, that was my week last week and um, a bit more of the same this week. Wonderful. Are you ready for our news stories? Yeah, let's kick it off. What have you brought us this week, Nick? Our first story is annual rental growth keeps falling. CoreLogic has reported that Australia's median rent increased just 0.2% in October, taking the annual increase to 5.8%, the lowest since April 2021. Focusing just on house rents, the year-on-year -year changes in the different cities were Perth, house rents rose 9.4%, Adelaide 6.7%, Hobart 6%, Melbourne 5.4%, Sydney 5.1%, Brisbane 4.4%, Canberra 3.2 and Darwin 2.1. Interestingly, despite this reduction in rental growth, property investing activity is strong. Investor borrowing rose 29.5% in the year to September, compared to 13.1% for owner-occupier borrowing, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Owen, I, I know that your company, Leafield, you're, uh, you operate in six states and territories, so you're someone who is really across what's happening with rental markets. Can you explain why do you think this slowdown is occurring in most parts of the country? Uh, thanks, Nick. Yes, it's um, uh, when we look at most of these capital cities, uh, a lot of them have had large rises in rents for for quite a long time. Uh, there are there are some that have been bubbling up and down, up and down. And so there's some um, seasonal um, activity happening there as well. And uh, but looking at the vast majority, you know, except for, for Perth, which I mean, those, those rates have dropped and um, they're going to continue to drop in Perth. Um, but um, looking at um, the, the rest of it, we've, we've been just uh, it, it's starting to get closer, closer to the inflation rate. And um, which is is a good thing because um, house rents contribute a lot to um, CPI figures. Hmm. From what you're seeing on the ground, how would you assess the market right now? So is it favoring investors? Is it favoring tenants? Is it neutral? Um, it's um, it changes from from area to area but um, generally it's becoming fairly neutral um, and it, it's 
uh, but it can change from month to month and um, and even within a, within a few weeks in some cases so a lot more supply can come on uh, at a particular time whether it's uh, uh, brand new builds that are coming onto the market or it's just a seasonal thing where at a certain point in, in a, each year a lot more properties come on the market for rent and they will um, and, and that will uh, you know, have the effect of supply and demand in that marketplace and uh, change the figures uh, accordingly of whether there's more supply or more demand. So, yeah, fairly neutral at the moment. Okay, well, well then, uh, one thing that jumped out at me is the fact that rents are going down, but uh, investor borrowing is going up. Is that surprising that those two things are moving in opposite directions? Yeah, well, it's not really rents are going down. It's just the rate of growth is decreasing. Mm. So it's um, so rents are still going up, um, just not at the crazy uh, um, amounts as uh, as before. So investor borrowing is definitely going up. Um, people still have equity. Um, they are looking for. Uh, places of value to invest and which is changing from um, every six months or so and um, yeah people are looking for um, good places to invest where they're getting decent um, decent return on their investment well let's move on to our next story this is something very different government imposing new obligations on real estate sector the federal government has recently proposed an anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing bill, which would extend this regime to certain high-risk services pro provided by, among others, real estate agents and conveyances. The Attorney General's Department Impact Analysis estimates the ongoing annual cost of the regime at approximately $1 billion per year for the property industry. In response, the CEO of the Real Estate Institute of Queensland, Antonio, Antonia Mercarella, says the new regime goes too far. We fully support the government's commitment to protecting the integrity of the Australian financial system, she said. However, the proposed framework doesn't take into account the practical challenges faced by real estate businesses, namely the lack of resources and specialised expertise needed to meet these complex compliance requirements. Further, the cost of compliance is unlikely to be absorbed by businesses without impacting the end price for buyers and sellers, making everyday real estate transactions more expensive for Australians. Oh, and Antonio Mercarella says most real estate agencies are small businesses, often with fewer than five employees, who don't have the expertise or the systems to meet these anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing obligations. Is she right? And if so, is the government imposing unfair obligations on the industry? Um, yes, yeah, she's she is right in from the point of view of most real estate businesses are small businesses that don't have the expertise and resources. And um, um, it, but does the government need to do it? Um, more than likely, yes, to be able to. Um, um, uh, protect the whole economy from anti-money laundering activities. And this was imposed on on the mortgage broking industry um, many, many years ago after the GFC. So we're talking you know, almost 15 years ago. And, um, and when you look at a lot of fraud that's um, uh, perpetrated, uh, it's uh, real estate agencies as well as conveyancing businesses, which is on that list as well. Um, for for this bill um are targets for fraudsters to be able to um um uh, steal their money and or steal the um the money of the clients that the agents and conveyances are are, are, are holding um funds for so it's um uh, i think the government needs to do it uh, funnily enough, I was uh, a approached to um, set up a time for a, a meeting by someone who's looking to provide a a service to real estate businesses um, uh, to be able to cater for for this proposed new bill. Um, so um, um, yes, I, I, it's uh, 
there, there will be tools and services out there that will come in. Uh, the issue is the increased cost and time and expertise that um, uh, these small businesses will need to um, employ and pay for um, to be able to um, um, fulfil their obli their obligations under under any new um, legislation. Well, on that note, Antonio Mercarella says a better approach for the government to take with this legislation would be for real estate agencies to be required to verify people's identities and report suspicious behaviour, but that more complex tasks, such as identifying where funds have come from, should be left to lawyers and accountants. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, that sounds reasonable because we're, we're um, uh, being able to identify um, people is something that um, is easy to do. Um, and in most states of Australia, we already need to do this. So it's uh, something where we need to be able to uh, collect a 100-point ID to make sure that uh, the owner of the property is um, who they say they are and um, so that we're we're paying uh, the rent out to the rightful owner of the property um, and we need to do that by verifying um, ownership and but and by verifying their um, identity as well mm, well i i just want to push back on you uh push back on something owen so so i know sure. you mentioned uh a few minutes ago that that you think uh real estate agencies do have a role in combating money laundering and, and counter terrorism uh, and terrorism financing but I, i'm wondering just to play devil's advocate here why should the real estate industry have to do that uh, i mean shouldn't that sort of thing be left entirely to the authorities um yes absolutely in terms of um uh in terms of capturing and um and, and prosecuting uh yes that is solely up to the authorities um but uh if if you're um on a busy street and the, with lots of cars going past all of the time and um you're there witnessing people speeding breaking the law doing things driving ways that they shouldn't um you know, do you have a right as a citizen to um, you know, report these people? And um, some people would say, no, mind your own business, um, let the police catch them. Um, but when we're dealing with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of other people's money um, that we're, we're in care of, if um, I, I think we, we do have a responsibility to be able to report any suspicious activity uh, it's, it's it's not our responsibility to you know to find them out and um, and you know um, uh, and prosecute them and and um, capture them on the behalf of the Australian public but I think we need to at least um, do our due, due diligence for uh, the sake of our own client base and um and then for um the the general public to protect um uh from these um people trying to steal all our money in australia so yeah we the least we can do is report them and if there are processes in place for us to be able to easily identify um and easily report these people, then I, I think it will make it easier and better for, for, for the industry. I'm glad to hear you're such a law-abiding citizen. Uh, to all the terrorists who are listening to this chat, I think they now know not to try to do any dirty transactions with Leafield. Of course, yes. No, we... Uh, uh, we, we uh, Touch wood, we haven't had any instances where we've um, been suspicious of, but um, of anyone trying to steal money. But um, but every, every time uh, we receive an email wanting to change bank account details, it's um, par for the course to be able to ring that client and um, confirm with them verbally that they've requested this 
um, because that's usually the start. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, well, thank you for sharing that, Owen. Interesting chat. Let's move on to our final news story, which is WA Rental Reforms Update. It's now been more than three months since Western Australia updated its rental regulations. Under the new regime, pets are allowed in most cases and disputes are heard by the new Commissioner for Consumer Protection. So how have things been going under the new regime? Well, the Real Estate Institute of Western Australia said most applications to the Commissioner for Consumer Protection had been from owners wanting to refuse a request to keep a pet. Quote, the most common reason given when seeking to refuse a request for a pet is the pet will cause damage or undue hardship to the property owner, Rewa said. However, it's not enough for owners to say the pet will cause damage. Owners need to provide evidence the pet will cause damage and provide evidence of the cost to repair that damage. When tenants make a request for a pet and owners want to challenge it, they must do so within 14 days. Otherwise, the tenant's request is approved. Oh, and WA's new rental rules also cover minor modifications to the home, but the commissioner has been receiving a lot more complaints from owners about pets than modifications. Does that surprise you? Um, probably not. Um, because that that's it's probably the um, um, uh, the, the the trigger that uh, would happen most often. And because most tenants wouldn't necessarily want to spend the money to make modifications, mm. um, some would, um, and it depends. But yes, quite a lot of tenants have pets, want to get pets, and so that that's probably the um, most common case that could trigger uh, a um, uh, this type of situation. Whenever we have a discussion about pets in rental properties. I always tell you about my dream of living with an alpaca and you tell me that uh, if the day comes when a tenant makes a request to keep an alpaca, you're going to share it with us. Since we last discussed this issue a couple of months ago, have there been any alpaca requests? I don't even have to think about this and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a no, Nick. Yeah. Okay, but it could happen one of these days. You're not ruling it out. No, not really it out. Not at all. It's um, yes, I, 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 it would most likely be on an acreage property, um, so um, or, or at least a very large residential lot, um, and it's um, yeah. So we'll wait and see. I'll, I'll definitely mark that on the calendar when it happens and uh, to remind me. Okay, fantastic. Uh, now, as we discussed earlier, your business lead field, it operates in six states and territories. So you've got experience of different regulations regarding pets. If you had to create your own set of pet regulations to apply throughout the country, what would those rules look like? Um, I think, yeah, very, very good question, Nick, because it's, it's something that uh, we always advise um, owners to not have a blanket ban on pets because sometimes pet owners can be the can be the um, best tenants that you can have uh, because they look after their tenants. Uh, and, sorry, they look after their pets and they look after the pets well, um, and they can be quite fussy. So if they're fussy about their pets, then they they'll be fussy about how they live and where they live. So. But on the other hand, bad tenants that have pets can can exacerbate um, the issue of having a pet. So, uh, and I think that's where it comes down to is the references. So if someone wants to have a pet, um, I, I, I think they should have the right to be able to have a pet. Um, but I think also the owner of the property should have the right to refuse an application from a tenant um, uh, after seeking references about um, with the tenant having had a pet in a previous property, and it's so so that they know what to expect. Um, and you know if there's uh, and, and that would then give them grounds to uh, refuse having the pet or um, 
or if they don't have grounds to refuse the refuse um, the pet, then they can't um, refuse the tenant based on having a pet only. So if I've understood correctly, you're suggesting that the fault position should be tenants are allowed to have pets unless owners can prove that they shouldn't be allowed to have them rather than uh, pets are banned unless tenants can prove while a pet, while, why a pet should be allowed. Yes, I, 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 don't, I don't see any issue with having pets um, to begin with. It's, uh, if the owner has allergies, um, that can be another good reason. Um, so if the owner has allergies and they're planning on you know, moving back into the property after um, a couple of years, then that's, that's a big deal. Um, so, um, the, yeah, there needs to be certain very good reasons like that as to why you can refuse a tenant application based on pets. Is this something that, uh, so looking at the different jurisdictions around the country, have the different states been, in terms of pet regulations, have they been moving towards the tenants? Uh, so has the balance of power, so to speak, been moving towards the tenants when it comes to pets? Yes, it definitely has been. And there are certain nuances and differences with each different state. And it's, um, yeah, so it's it's um, a balancing act. And, and when you've got an owner that uh, has a, a blanket policy of no pets, then yes, you need to carefully go through legislation and explain to them of exactly what that means for them and um, yeah, what the process will need to be. And um, we need to come up with um, how they can substantiate the reasons for, for not allowing a, a, um, a pet. Well, this has been a really good chat. We've spoken about money laundering, alpacas, so we've covered all the big issues. Of course. We always do, Nick. We always do. Uh, love hearing your expert insight, your expert insight, so on, and looking forward to chatting next week. I've always look forward to our chats every week, Nick. And uh, yes, we'll uh, see you same time then. Mm -hmm.